Sylvia, it's uh, an absolute pleasure to meet you, and uh, thanks for taking the time to do this. Well, the same back to you. Thank you for taking your time talking about <laughs> something we both care about. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, ab absolutely. Where is actually your base right now? I am speaking to you from sunny northern California. <laughs> Excellent. Are, are you feeling the effects of climate change there, uh, as, as we see on the news and everywhere else, I guess? The air is a little smoky with fires that are too close for comfort. No kidding. I mean, the, there is evidence of climate change all over the planet. Yeah. We better yeah. listen up. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. It's, it's a very worrying time on that. Where to start? I mean, your, your life is just an incredible, massive achievements and acknowledgements. It's, um, you've got a book coming out on the 14th of November? That yeah. is correct, yes. Yeah, it's excellent. It's available I, to order right now, but the actual hold-in-your-hand version <laughs> will be available in November. And it, you know, some people really had, all of us had kind of a rough time during 2020, but I, I turned it to my advantage in a way by hunkering down and reflecting on thousands of hours of exploring the ocean and tapping in to information gathered by many colleagues and wrote the book called National Geographic Ocean, a Global Odyssey. So it, it really gave me an opportunity to dive in vicariously to something about where did the ocean come from and what is water anyway <laughs> and who lives there and to be able to portray it in a way that I hope is, is accessible and meaningful to people of all ages everywhere. I'm, I'm sure it will be. I've only able to um, have a look at a PDF copy, uh, which is kind of hard to read. Um, I look forward to seeing the proper book uh, when it comes out. But just to say, I mean, the first thing that strikes you is the images. I mean, they are staggering. And the amount of text that I've read is, is just beautifully written. But I'd, li I'd like to come on to that in a minute. Because if you would indulge me, there's just one thing I have to ask you about. And I'm sure you've been asked millions of times before, and this is about the gym suit. <laughs> when 50s and 60s, I was growing up, it was Jack Gusto. And the TV was there, his wonderful films and adventures. And then as I started my career uh, making wildlife films and stuff, in the late 70s, your name came up as diving to 1,250 feet in a one atmosphere suit. Well, I have to tell you that that just, I, I didn't know what to think. It was an amazing thing because we'd never, I mean, women doing things, let alone men was extraordinary at that time. Can you tell us just a little bit about that amazing dive? Well, I'm sure that you, like most divers, look at constantly looking at how deep you are, how much time you have, and especially when you get to a drop off, and you you might be as as deep as divers comfortably can go on air at you know thirty meters or so, and you know you can go down to maybe fifty meters for a short time and allowing for stops on the way back to let the nitrogen out of your system as much as you can before going back to the surface. But the idea of being able to go right to the edge of where light penetrates at one atmosphere in a diving suit that with arms and legs, you know, so you're, you're really like a diver, but to be able to go deeper and stay longer. I had two and a half hours you know, more than 400 meters and, and to be able to walk around comfortably. It wasn't as 
<laughs> effortless as being a diver, but I could go and I could be there to see creatures with bioluminescence, little fish with lights down their side and coral, corals that sprouted from the ocean floor, not the kinds of corals you typically see in sunlit reefs, but the deep corals and some with bioluminescence. When I touch them, they burst with blue rings of light, that bamboo corals, single, like big whiskers, unbranched, that, would, that sprouted from the ocean floor. And well, I, I was just like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> It was wonderful. And I, you know, I, I channeled William Beebe, who, when I was a kid, I read his book, Half Mile Down, and dreamed of being able to do what he and his engineer colleague, Otis Barton, were able to do in the 1930s, to go in a little submarine, literally half mile down, and see bioluminescent creatures that lived in total darkness, except for the flash, sparkle, and glow of bioluminescent creatures that divers can see when they dive at night. Or even if you're a beachcomber, if you go out at night, you sometimes can see waves just crashing along the shore. Little, If you walk, you can kick up the sand, the wet sand, and see that blue light that is caused by organisms that make their own living light, like fireflies and glowworms. But it's a common form of communication in the sea. Yeah, absolutely. Since you did that, made that dive, I mean, you've done some incredible things, which I am extremely jealous of. <laughs> it's been a fantastic life you've led. Has for you, has there, has there been anything as exciting as that dive? In that, in that well, stage? every dive is exciting. You know, yeah. people ask me, what's your best dive ever? And I say, yeah. it's the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, absolutely. And pe people often ask, you know, what's your favorite animals and what's your favorite dive? What do you like? And as you say, it's it's the next one. It really is. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for that. Back to your book. Um, coming out again, uh, 14th of November. Uh, who was your target audience for that, do you think? Who Everyone, you everywhere, people? all the time. I mean, I think that the whole idea of communicating in a way that that really, I mean, the goal is to touch people with more than facts and figures, although there's plenty of that, but to inspire people to want to go and see for themselves. So there's beautiful images that you referred to, tapping into National Geographic's great library, but also the others who are out there, down there, as never before, able to access the sea with technologies that did not exist when you began diving, when I began diving years ago. It's getting so much better to be able to use, you know, remember diving with a camera, you probably have done this, you have either 24 or 36 exposures, and that's it. <laughs> Let's take some cameras. And then you can double the number of images you can take. But now to be able to not be limited by the number of photographs you can take with a new digital means of doing so and to film more readily underwater so you can actually capture some of the behaviors that before might have been observed, but really very difficult in the past to capture. It's not easy now, but at least you have some hope of being able to record and share the, the kinds of behaviors that are happening all the time. But our access to the sea has really blossomed in my time. And I've witnessed the changes in our ability to be in the sea and to understand what we couldn't see before, that every fish has a face that lobsters, individuals have behaviors that we, I think, have 
<laughs> evolved in our respect for life in the ocean. They're not just lumps of something to be regarded as seafood, but these are sea creatures. These are our fellow citizens on the planet, worthy of our, our respect and to treat them with dignity and be bewitched by their behavior. They're so exciting to see this great range of, of the variety, the diversity of life. It's been sad to see the decline of life in the sea, but also inspiring to see that when we protect the ocean and, and do what is documented in, in the book, Ocean of Global Odyssey, that when we regard the ocean with respect and care and protect areas, it's amazing how life prospers and can recover. There are actually more whales today than when I was a kid. When I was a child, whalers were still celebrated as heroic humans who braved the elements to kill whales. Now, it's not considered particularly honorable to kill whales now that we know them and understand how important they are alive. Maybe we'll get that, to that same place with tunas and swordfish and other creatures as well. We, uh, they have a value far beyond <laughs> something to eat, pounds of meat and barrels of oil. I mean, it's, divers are ambassadors. They see what most others never have the opportunity to see to engage life in the ocean in ways other than swimming with lemon slices and butter on your plate. <laughs> yes, indeed. It, it, it is, I do find it extremely frustrating and I get angry sometimes. I don't know if you ever get angry about how things are going, but with technology, as you're saying, which now gives people easy access to being underwater, and the cameras are fantastic, as you're saying, you know, the GoPros and all the rest of it, which take amazing pictures. I still find that if I'm with a group or taking a group, they go down and take wonderful pictures. And when they come back up, they'll eat a fish supper or they'll, have, they'll order lobster in the restaurant or calamari. And I love that. I... <laughs> There is a disconnect. We don't go to the zoo and eat the giraffes and elephants, but you can go to aquariums, even aquariums, and at the restaurants <laughs> serve the very creatures that you were you were observing in 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 the, and 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 we're dazzled by them. And divers should be the first ones to say. <laughs> You know, why are we doing this? These are wild creatures. We don't eat songbirds. Why are we eating their wild equivalent underwater? Parrotfish. It, it, I, I am stunned by the new taste that has developed just in very recent times. Maybe because the other fish are gone, people have turned to parrotfish. And even surgeonfish and, and other creatures that before were, were just not something that we would think of consuming ourselves. And with this new appetite for fish that were never on our menu until quite recently, we're, we're destroying coral reefs. We're dismembering the systems that it's not just about the corals. It's about all the creatures that make the ocean viable, healthy systems. By taking sharks and swordfish and the groupers and snappers, we have stripped these systems of critical elements. So in places such as the Caribbean and the Mediterranean, you know, 80, 90% of the reefs are gone. And it isn't just because we go out and deliberately <laughs> harm the coral reefs. We've, we've taken elements of what makes coral reefs viable. And, and we've done it thinking that it doesn't matter, that the ocean is too big to fail, or that 
we, we can protect the corals, but by taking other forms of life, we, we undermine the capacity of reefs to prosper. Yeah, uh, 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 absolutely. It, I often feel that we are simply documenting what's left. Because I, I personally d don't see much of an upward trend of things reviving. And th that makes me kind of sad that um, one day your books, my films, whatever, will be historic. And yeah, they are. And they are already. A lot of them are. It's, it's so true. And yet, and yet, I do see a change. I do see divers now because they are witnesses like you and, and I too am a witness of this change. We don't have to read about how good it was in the, <laughs> we're, we're observing even, even kids are witnesses of the changes. And yes, climate is part of what is affecting land and sea in ways that are comprehensive, but it's also what we're putting into the ocean, what we're taking out of the ocean, actions that we can change. And in so doing, by restoring, protecting the places that are still in pretty good shape and restoring what we can, the places that have been depleted, stop the killing, increase the caring, hope spots, a network of places around the world. They're now, as documented in the book, this ocean of global odyssey. There are now more than a hundred and, well, there are about 140 places where local champions, mostly divers, or those who are maybe doing something else in their life, but they also dive and can share their view and bring about a change in attitude in, in their communities sometimes in their countries and bringing about our bringing about the shift of understanding that by protecting the ocean, they can be places that we know and love can be restored to better health. We cannot go back to what it was like 50, a hundred, a thousand years ago, but we can turn from where we are to get to a better place. So, National Geographic has a program called Pristine Seas, identifying those places that are still in pretty good shape. What we're doing with Mission Baloo, similarly, to look at places that are still in good condition, inspire people to, to in, really embrace them with care, to get governments to officially declare them as protected areas. Right now, only about 3% of the ocean has have high forms of protection, fully or highly protected. The goal is in the next 10 years, let's go for at least 30%. Half would be even better. By 2050, why not embrace half of the world, land and sea, with enhanced official proactive protection, understanding that our lives, our existence, our health, our security, our economy, whatever it is you care about, it really depends on taking care of the natural systems that make our existence possible. And we can do it. We're the lucky ones. This is truly the sweet spot in time because now we know what could not be known 50, 100, 1,000 years ago, even 10 years ago. We're getting better and better about understanding our place within the natural world, it keeps us alive. And we've got to get better about taking seriously the actions, mostly it's restraint. We have this habit of clear cutting forests so we can plant buildings, so we can plant <laughs> agriculture, so we can plant whatever it is, so we can take over the natural world. But there's a cost and now we're beginning to understand it that destroying mangroves and seagrass meadows so we can extend our reach into the ocean by 
clear cutting the ocean of wildlife, of the tunas, the swordfish, the shrimp, the cod, the herring, all these wild creatures, we need them alive much more than we need them as luxury features on our menu. We can live without, without consuming tuna, but we might figure out that we need to keep them alive so we ourselves can stay alive. <laughs> They're part of what makes the planet function. So let's give back. Let's uh, use the mighty power of those of us who've been witnesses underwater about how beautiful it is and how important it is. This is the time to do it. In, in many ways, I, and I agree fully with what you're saying, the future of all this is basically in the hands of the consumer. Mm. You know, Miss, Mr. Smith and Mrs. Smith and the family who live in the middle of the city have no connection to the natural world, never mind the oceans. And they have fish in their supermarkets, da, 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 and, and the rest. If somebody's checked it out, then it must be okay. If yeah. It's in the, well, how know, do you tackle that? How, how, do, you, how do you approach? Possible. Like with this conversation we're having, maybe we'll reach some people who might say, I never thought about it that way before. Mm -hmm. You know, you get fish and chips and you say, hmm, fish and chips, what kind of fish is this? You might ask. Most people don't. But maybe if you do ask, so there are 33,000 kinds of fish, and we just call them fish. There's 9,000 kinds of birds, but we know when we're eating chicken and turkey. We don't say, I'm having Kentucky fried bird, or I'm having this, this hamburger. It's usually beef, right? It's not just mammal, or maybe it is, but <laughs> we don't think of it. We kind of believe that it's, it's cow that we're eating. But when you look at fish, you have no idea. Fish on the menu, catch of the day, fish and chips, fish chowder. What kind of fish? Well, you should want to ask and know. Well, you probably are eating tuna when it's advertised as tuna, but maybe not. There are a lot of things that go under the guise of, of tuna. And certainly sea bass can be anything. It can be tilapia. It can be probably variations on the theme of, of I don't know, various plant material can be sold as fake fish or real fish. You know, how would you know? No, you, you, you don't. And I mean, occasionally I'll... I'll go through the uh, fishmongers. I mean, I haven't eaten seafood for as long as I remember, but I go through just to see what's there, see what people are buying. And some of the stuff I know isn't what it's advertised as. And I look at it and I think, this is now on its last legs. Everything else that we used to eat, all the cod, the herring, et cetera, et cetera, in, in, here in the, in, in the uh, UK, it's pretty well gone. And now we're eating things like gurnard and uh, stuff that normally you wouldn't even think about. People, but it, yeah. it's still sold uh, under the, the disguise of batter uh, as a very edible fish. Right. Well, edible is one thing. <laughs> but for a lot of things we choose not to eat because we value them for reasons beyond sustenance mm -hmm. or a luxury taste. We, our success as a species is largely derived from our versatility, our adaptability, our ability to consume a great variety of things and be, be able to survive and even, be, even thrive to be healthy. It's perfectly clear that we don't need to eat animals at all to be healthy. And there's plenty of evidence. It's also plenty of evidence that throughout our history, plants have dominated our diet. 
that we have learned to consume animals of all sorts, including insects and earthworms and grasshoppers and crickets and things. <laughs> Many people revolted at the thought that because we are adaptable and can consume a great variety of things, we have looked at the ocean as a banquet, as a grocery store. And most of all, we've looked at it as free goods, free, free food. There's a cost to what we take that we grow. We know that farmers have to pay taxes and they have to buy seeds and they have to take care of cows and chickens and pigs and you have to provide food for them. But from the ocean, fish and shrimp and lobsters, all those other sea creatures, clams, oysters have a zero accounting base. They're free. So that's bad news for life in the ocean because people with no investment or with an investment of boats or whatever, they don't have to pay for what they extract. And that has to change because in a sense, we're all paying. We're now equating the life in the ocean as blue carbon, as trees are to climate, so are the fish and other creatures, including whales, blue carbon. By extracting large quantities of life from the ocean, we are affecting climate. I mean, it, it, it's just a step away when you think about trees, we understand, capture carbon and store it in their roots in the soil. We're beginning to respect trees and protect trees and value plants on the land because it affects carbon capture and storage. International Monetary Fund commissioned a study that was released in 2020 in Davos at the World Economic Forum about the carbon value of whales, a trillion dollars was the value they have accorded to whales alive because of their carbon relative to capturing and holding carbon and their importance in terms of, of stabilizing climate. If we take the whales and turn them into carbon dioxide, which is what happens when you kill them, if you keep them in the ocean, they store the carbon and they also put nutrients back in the ocean that power photosynthesis the forests of microplants in the ocean, the microforests of phytoplankton that capture carbon and then send it through the food chain. Okay, so it works for whales. If we value the carbon capture and storage of whales at a trillion dollars, what about tuna? What about cod? What about swordfish? What about all the other creatures, the millions the hundreds of millions of tons of ocean wildlife that we turn into carbon dioxide and methane when we release them, when we take them out of the ocean and either they rot or they're, they're put into the food chain and, and burned as energy. It's clear cutting the ocean of the carbon that is out there that would normally be maintained in the ocean is blue carbon and stored eventually in the deep sea. We hadn't thought about fish and other wildlife in the ocean that way until quite recently, but the evidence is clear. And now we know, and now we can have informed decisions in ways that we could not when I was a child about the value of the living ocean and life in the ocean to our existence. And relating it to climate, the headline issue of our time is I think an important new insight that, that can inform us with the decisions we take about why the ocean matters and what we can do individually and collectively to stabilize the, the, the decline that we're now experiencing land and sea and be a part of this this time of recovery. We can be the heroes, if you will, by the decisions we make and the choices we make right now that can turn from decline to recovery. 
that's a that's cause for celebration. You you can be doom and gloom about <laughs> the bad news that is all around us, or you can say, look, I am an informed citizen, and especially divers who know more about the ocean through their personal experience than even some scientists know who who don't have that experience of getting into the ocean and seeing it firsthand why the ocean matters to all of us all the time everywhere yes tell me do, do your children dive of course ah fantastic <laughs> <laughs> excellent it's just i have no choice <laughs> sorry they had no choice <laughs> <laughs> But the, 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 I actually, they did have a choice, but yeah. you couldn't keep them out of the ocean. Why no. would I even try? <laughs> so they feel the same as you? Well, everyone, I think, has a different perspective because we're all individuals. Sure. And we all see, have different experiences and, and different ways of expressing their, of their love of the ocean. My grandsons too, you know, I have have um, one who has become an artist, an underwater photographer uh, like you, and really sees art as a means of of expression and and of bringing about change. Um, one of my grandsons has taken on science as his passion and combining art and science is, is really something that I see happening with great enthusiasm and, and with a means of, of taking, of, of getting people to understand what should be obvious. Sometimes it's not unless you have someone to share the view. William Beebe shared his view of the ocean with words and with a few, not with, with photographs, because underwater photographs back in the 1920s and early 30s were <laughs> very uncommon. But now, I mean, so paintings of the ocean, of, of what he saw, really inspired me. And his words inspired me. And now we have new ways of inspiring those who haven't been as lucky as some of us to get down into the ocean. Maybe they'll want to go and see for themselves. They should. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I wish more people could could see what we've seen. It, it's. I noticed in, in your book you have um, a lot of contributors. Yes. Um, what was it like working with so many people? Did, did, did you all agree on the same things or did you find you had views that conflicted with each other or uh, did it all just go smoothly? And there's the book, Done and Dusted. Well, there are profiles of individuals, champions, visionaries, if you will, who have come with their perspectives, but all are sharing their experiences, whether it's from Edith Witter, who's an expert in bioluminescence, has been to places, seen things that others have, have not seen, but they're there to be seen. Uh, James Cameron, who's been to the deepest part of the ocean, and Victor Boscolo also. Like astronauts who go high in the sky, they don't keep the word to themselves. They come back and say, I want you to look over my shoulder. I want you to see and know what I have seen. And it, it enriches all of us to have the opportunity to be able to share the view, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, that's great. It reads very well. And it's, and it's lovely reading all, all, all the, from all the different writers. I mean, it's, it's, it's great stuff. Um, I look forward to seeing the real book because, as I say, the PDF is you have to keep scrolling across lines and uh, it, it doesn't quite work. 
but um, I, I see also you, you have a research vessel named after you. <laughs> I do. This is with Aurora Expeditions, a research vessel that travels pole to pole and many places in between. And I expect to be traveling to Antarctica in 2023. And we are inviting people to actually apply to become brain trust that we want to assemble to actually go to Antarctica with an eye toward the changing climate. And polar regions have an enhanced impact on the planet as we now know it. <laughs> and, and to be able to deliberate on what we can now do to turn from decline to recovery to finding an enduring place for ourselves within the natural, mostly ocean systems that shape the world we live in. Yeah. Good luck with that. I hope that all goes really well. I mean, what an exciting trip. Um, I can imagine the applications are going to be vast. People, well, well, yes, people want to join you. So it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you and talking to you. Just, um, is there anything left now on your wish list on, on the things that oh. you would like to do? Most of the ocean has never been seen by any human. So every dive you're likely to see something, new species, new behaviors, new insights. I mean, it's, it's, the, the greatest era of exploration is literally just beginning. The next 10 years, it is hoped that by that, that individuals, institutions, organizations are committed to coming together to map the ocean floor for the first time, perhaps with the same degree of accuracy that we have for the moon, for Mars, for Jupiter, and for the rest of the planet. As you see, you know, now maybe as much as 15% of the ocean floor has been mapped, but that's just the bottom of the ocean. We know about the top, mostly, but all of the ocean in between, average depth, two and a half miles, about the depth where the Titanic rests, 4,000 meters below the surface. All of the area in between is mostly unexplored. You get below where divers can go and even where divers go. You, you, <laughs> you know you're likely to see something new every time you go, and you're almost guaranteed. Then you get down to 1,000 feet or anywhere in the deep sea. My friend Richard Pyle, who's profiled in the book, Ocean, a Global Odyssey, says that when he gets down to about even 100 meters, let alone 200 meters, he discovers on the order of a dozen new species of fish per hour per hour that he's submerged. So how many other things are out there, down there, aside from new kinds of fish? All the galaxy of life. I mean, all the many divisions of animals are in the ocean. Only about half occur on the land and in freshwater, these categories of life. When you dive into the sea, it's like, diving into the history of life on earth. And <laughs> even if you're not seeing new things, new to the human experience, it might be new to you. <laughs> and what's more exciting than finding things that you've never seen before? <laughs> yes, absolutely. But, you know, even on... on shallow diving I do here. I have, I have one particular little wreck which I like to visit and 
over the summer there's been one cuckoo ras and you know i see him every dive right and every dive something different happens <laughs> it's, it's it's not like you can predict what he's going to do or what the fish around him are going to do or what's going to interact with him and, and it's just a learning thing every single dive with that same fish I'll bet, the, I'll bet the thought has never occurred to you. You wonder how he tastes. <laughs> Fried and boiled. Not, not, not at all. Some <laughs> <laughs> people need to look at the ocean yes, with yes. that view in mind. Yeah. <laughs> Although last week there was a fishing angling competition here, and I prayed well, they didn't go on my wreck. You know, it, I, it was. Why? Oh, I mean, I don't understand why the joy of killing. I just don't understand. The joy of living is so profound. Why we teach kids, we teach our children, we give them guns, we give them hooks and lines and celebrate killing. I so look forward to a time when really we celebrate giving the gift of life and, and enjoying what you have just described, getting to know that little rass. Uh, the octopus teacher, the film, my octopus teacher, that's the kind of joy we should be sharing, not let's go kill something. <laughs> let's see how many sharks we can kill or how many fish we can catch, or can we catch the biggest fish, which would be the oldest fish, the ones with the greatest knowledge, the greatest ability, to create more fish. I mean, we have it so wrong, but we are at a turning point. We are, I see it everywhere. The dive shops used to be full of spear guns and sometimes with fishing gear. That's giving way to, here, look at the latest kind of, of cameras and, and anybody can take a little camera out and come back with stories to tell. It, it's the most important thing that we can take out of the ocean is knowledge, stories, excitement, joy, and the gift of giving back. I, it, it really is painful to see how we celebrate killing. Mm -hmm. I, I, and on a positive side, that that film, the, my Octopus Teacher. A oh, stunning film. I loved it. Oh, that was done with holding your breath. It was done snorkeling. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, to be able to have that kind of relationship with, with a mollusk, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just should encourage people, inspire people to look at the ocean with new eyes and, and maybe with new hope that within the next 10 years, maybe we are able to, can, I know we can, but will we? Do we have the ability to shift our, our way of looking at life on the land and in the sea, the joy of living? And, and protecting life should not be a big um, <laughs> goal to say, let's protect 30% of the ocean or maybe half of the ocean in our lifetime. Why not? To give back. We've taken so much for so long from the land and from the sea to foster our prosperity. But if our prosperity is to continue, we cannot continue to take at the same comprehensive level that we have in the past. It's simply not possible and still have a future at least as good as what we have experienced in the past. We know what to do. Embrace nature with care. Yeah. Give nature a break. Yeah. Give the fish a break. Give the lobsters and shrimp <laughs> and all the other creatures a chance to recover. 
It's make peace with nature. Mm-hmm. It's find a place for ourselves within the systems that keep us alive. It's within our power to do this. Whales are really smart. Elephants are really intelligent, but they do not know, cannot see what the kids of today, what all of us now can see. Yeah. So let's go, let's go diving. <laughs> let's go diving. I mean, I, I, I won't keep you. Um, I know you're very busy. I just read somewhere that as a kid, you were on the beach, I believe, and got sucked in by a wave. I did. And there was a small quote, I don't know if it's from you or the person that wrote it, saying, since then, the sea has never let you go, which I thought was a <laughs> wonderful thing to say. Had that wave not taken you in, what do you think you might have been doing now? Oh, I, I the ocean got my attention. <laughs> but life in the ocean has held my attention ever since. Those big horseshoe crabs, the seaweed, the starfish, all of the creatures that were along the shore fascinated me and would have drawn me into the ocean one way or the other. They did, and they still do. (laughs) Ah, brilliant. Lovely. So uh, thank you very much again for your time. Lovely to talk to you. And um, best of luck with the book. I mean, I just hope everybody reads it. And I hope they take on board the conservation uh, sections at the end as well. So important. Thank you. You know, the book was written to be a story of the ocean with a lot of short stories throughout. So whether you devour it in one big feast yeah. <laughs> or whether you enjoy little bites. <laughs> yeah. I think for me, bite size, because it's so full. I mean, you've taken us from the very creation of oceans right through to today. And there's just so much information and knowledge in there. Um, yeah, for me, it'll be bite sized so I can <laughs> take it all in really. But the last portion of the book is really trying to answer the questions that I'm asked all the time. Why should I care about the ocean? About how the ocean affects everyone everywhere all the time, but also how we are affecting the ocean everywhere, all of us, all the time. And what we can do to find harmony with the ocean, that what we've put into the ocean, what we've taken out of the ocean, the ignorance about the ocean has really been costly. But the great good news is now we know. We know what to do. We know why it matters. So let's just do it. This is the time. (laughs) Yes, it is. Yes, perfect. (laughs) Sylvia, thank you very much indeed. And um, take care and good diving. All right, you too. Maybe we'll meet underwater. That was perfect. <laughs> I look forward to it. Bye for now. <laughs> Bye.